Hi, my name is Lexi Pandell, and I'm going to read my story, Hill House, from the new collection, Berkeley Noir. Hill House. I arrive at the Hill House and pull out my phone to double check the address. A droplet of sweat clings to the tip of my nose and I blow it off. It splashes on the screen, just missing the jagged crack across the front. It's the right place. Patrick Bloom's house is smaller than I'd expected, only two stories high. But when I peer through a gap in the massive wooden fence, I can tell that it's nice. One of those Berkeley homes with old bones, scaled all over in brown shingles. This whole street is stacked with unassuming multi-million dollar houses. I lock my bike to a no parking sign and try to catch my breath. When I moved back to Berkeley from New York, everyone told me I should get a bike. Unfortunately for me, I'd forgotten why I never biked when I was growing up here. Worse than the shitty drivers are the hills, like the one up to this house. I had to get off my bike after nearly keeling over backward. October has brought its unseasonable and unfortunately named Indian summer heat. While my friends back east are bundling up for autumn, I'm wearing a tank top featuring the leering cow mascot, Oski, and my dark hair is twirled in a bun, and I'm still pouring sweat. The wet strap of my duffel bag bites into my shoulder. I unlatch the gate and walk through a garden to get to the front door. Tomatoes on tangles of vines, plumes of herbs, beans racing along trellises like string lights, Fireworks of green leaves belonging to carrots, kale, lettuce, beets. There's even a raised bed with corn. Who the fuck grows corn at home? Patrick Bloom, I guess. I knock, willing my stomach to untie itself from its knot. After a moment, Patrick Bloom, the world's most renowned health writer, opens the door and looks out. Not in an unfriendly way, just a little blank, until he sees my shirt and bag and realizes that I am the grad student there to house sit. Mariana? I nod, and he lets me in. It's the kind of house designed to feel like a home. I'd seen it featured in a magazine before. In addition to Patrick Bloom's writing, his wife designed book covers, a few of them famous. Their home has long been the subject of public interest. Patrick Bloom shows me how to work the oven, where to find the bathroom, how to access the deck with a view of San Francisco. His famous mop of curly white hair is even bigger in person. A thin spot burrowed at the back of his head makes it look a little like a halo. Patrick Bloom stands for something that intrigues me. Cleanliness. Health. Wholesomeness. The idea that your life can be better if you eat quinoa and listen to your body and walk more. Not that his work isn't based on science, just that the resulting advice is so simple and smart that you hate yourself for not thinking of it first. I devoured all of his books while I was living in New York, bartending and filing the odd music review for an alt-weekly. I applied to journalism school at Cal, where Patrick Bloom is a professor with the assumption that I wouldn't get in. When I showed up for the new student tour, the admissions officer flashed a crocodile smile and told me that she thought my essay was excellent. I don't remember what I wrote, though I do know that I mentioned Patrick Bloom. Patrick Bloom's assistant is a second year student named Eloise. She's blonde and so skinny that the bones of her knees show through her jeans. She snacks on baby carrots and hummus while she uses the school computers to plow through research for Patrick Bloom's upcoming book. She must use the printers ten times as much as any other student. She delivers his reading material in hard copy, hulking scientific studies, long articles, entire ebooks. There are only a handful of teaching assistants in our program. Most of them, well, teach. But Eloise is entirely dedicated to Patrick Bloom. The university covers her tuition. That's how much she's worth to them. Eloise was handpicked by the TA before her, and someday she too will pass the torch. It's competitive. Rumor has it that a recommendation from Patrick Bloom will snag you a job at any top magazine. 
Eloise was the one who suggested my house sitting for Patrick Bloom when she was called away for her grandfather's funeral in Connecticut. Is that something you do a lot? I asked. House sitting? Yeah, but it's not weird. And his house is amazing. So it's like fun. Patrick Bloom leads me upstairs. Photos of him and his wife posing with various celebrities. Feminine touches a throw pillow here or a watercolor painting there. We walk past his children's rooms. Nautical theme for the boy with model ships lining his windowsill. The girls is painted ballet shoe pink. It looks like a family of four still lives here, but his children are off at college and his wife died three years ago. I know this because he wrote an award-winning memoir about cooking for her while she was dying. She designed the book cover as her last major piece. I thought it was kind of ugly and maudlin if I'm being honest, but the writing was some of his best. We pass a room with a big wooden door, his study. The door is locked. He doesn't have to tell me that it's off limits. I think he's going to show me to a guest room, but instead he leads me to the master bedroom. This is where you'll stay. I drop my duffel. The walls are painted brown, and there are wide windows with no blinds. It's like the mouth of a cave. A little unconventional, I know, he says. The design of the room is based on scientific research on the optimal sleeping environment. I'm writing about it in my next book. He doesn't seem to think it's odd that I just smile and nod at everything he says. I'm a terrible journalism student. I don't ask nearly enough questions. Downstairs, he drums the refrigerator with his fingers and tells me to eat anything I like. He doesn't mind. He shows me back out to the garden and tells me to harvest. Whatever you don't pick will go bad. He considers a zucchini, small but plump. He yanks it from the vine. It'll rot, especially in this heat. A car pulls up out front and honks lightly. Patrick Bloom dashes inside for his luggage. He can't possibly be leaving already. I barely know anything about his home. But indeed, he is. He shakes my hand and thanks me. His skin is still sticky from the zucchini. If anything comes up, my number's on the fridge, he tells me. And then he is gone. I go inside. The zucchini remains on the table where he left it. I pick it up and sniff. It smells green. I hate zucchini. I put it down and retrace my steps from the tour, exploring for a second time at my own pace. I realize I'm holding my breath. No one is here monitoring me. I don't know why I'm afraid. I go to the bathroom and see a flash of highlighter bright urine in the bowl. Jesus. I flush the toilet before sitting down. A rack of magazines flank the toilet. Food, lifestyle, travel. Do all rich people keep their magazines in the bathroom? Has he ever run out of toilet paper and had to rip off a page to use on his ass? It's nearly dinner time, and the sun streaming through the windows turns orange. I only brought two things to eat, a jar of peanut butter and a box of granola bars. I had planned to bike to the grocery store. I'm grateful I can eat his food. Fuck dealing with that hill again. Plus, how many people can say they've eaten something from Patrick Bloom's garden? I text a photo of it to my brother, Jack. We are not related by blood, but we grew up together, and I'm an only child, so he's the closest thing to a sibling I have. Got any tips about picking this stuff? I write. I know zilch about gardening, but Jack does in a way. When Jack was 15 and I was 11, my mom found pressed pills in his backpack. He told me they weren't for him just something he was selling. I don't know what explanation he gave my mom, but it wasn't good enough. She went ballistic. The next day, we woke up and Jack was gone. Two weeks later, a farm worker visiting family in Oakland saw the poster with Jack's face and called us with a tip. We drove an hour and a half to Gilroy but we found Jack kneeling in a strawberry field. He had grown tan enough that, with his bandana and hoodie, he fit in with the dozens of scrawny Mexican guys out there. The biggest difference was that, while they wore steel-toed work boots, he had on his scuffed-up Doc Martens. 
The car ride back to Berkeley started out quiet. Even from the back seat, I could see that his hands were dirty and blistered. You stink, my mom said finally. It was true, a cloud of stench, sweet and earthy. If you're not going to let me make money my way, Jack said, I'll make it another way. I don't give a fuck about what you do on the street. You're not my kid, but don't bring that shit into my home. I find anything else and you're out. After that, Jack took odd jobs, doing yard work for frat houses and rich professors near campus, though I'm fairly certain he kept dealing on the side. Now in Patrick Bloom's garden with the late day sun beating on my bare shoulders, I stare at my phone. I know Jack isn't going to respond to my text, but I wait for a few minutes anyway. I guess I'll have to do it myself. I pull a cucumber off the vine, pluck some late season tomatoes, and rip a head of lettuce from the ground. In the kitchen, I find some knives, Japanese, very sharp. I cut open the cucumber to discover that it's disgusting, pulpy and warm. The lettuce is okay, though I find dead winged insects lining the crotch of the leaves. I wash it five times. I slice in the, into the tomatoes, but miscalculate and catch the end of my finger. It spurts. Shit. I wrap it in a paper towel and then wipe the little droplets of blood from the cutting board. It's not until I'm eating the salad that I taste the metallic tang of the blood I missed. The cutting board I used is made of a porous wood, and by the time I rinse it after dinner, it's stained. It seems atmospheric to read Patrick Bloom's books at his house during my first night there, and he has copies on the bookshelf with uncracked spines. I take a couple to the living room and flip to my favorite sections, a preface about foraging for mushrooms in the wilds of Humboldt County, a chapter about our genetic similarities to flies, a passage that compares Gatorade with the water left out for hummingbirds. Normally, I read his books and feel excited about the possibility of language and how bizarre the world is. Tonight, it just exhausts me. It's stuffy in here. It feels like my insides are stewing. I fight to keep my eyes open. The words swim on the page. I need to sleep. I go upstairs and lie down on Patrick Bloom's bed, but I can't drift off. This room gives me the creeps. It's the kind of room where someone would go to die, dark and primitive. Every time I roll over, I catch my reflection in the shadeless windows and my heart jumps, certain that I'm seeing a ghost. I almost pass out, but the howl of a distant Amtrak jolts me awake. It is shockingly, terribly hot. I jump out of bed and rattle the windows, but there's no way to open them. There are no fans either. I swing the door open, praying for circulation. I pluck my iPhone off the bedside table. No response from Jack. Not that I've gotten one from him in months, but still. Nighttime is Jack's time. My mom always hounded him about staying up until three, four, five in the morning and then sleeping all day long. If he'll ever respond, it's now. My mom met Jack's dad, Des, when I was four and she was a freshman at Cal. She had recently returned to school after my birth derailed her life. Des managed a top dog. When Des replaced my spot in my mother's bed, I moved to a cot in the living room. Jack slept on the couch. We weren't supposed to have more than two people in the apartment, but nobody ratted on us. Our neighbors had all kinds of things they weren't supposed to. Pets, drugs, massage businesses, subletters. Jack was twice my age and a mystery to me even then. He had a sullen, boyish beauty. At night, if I turned over toward the couch and opened my eyes, I'd usually find him awake and staring back. I began to think of Jack as nocturnal, something other than human. Just before finals week of her junior year, a crushed lilac bruise appeared around my mother's eye. She made Des pack his bags while she was off in some lecture hall, filling in the bubbles on a Scantron. She ended up getting an A. After that, I moved back into the bedroom with her. 
Jack stayed on our couch, and Des sent money every month. What kind of guy dumps his kid with an ex like that? A guy like Des. He wasn't a junkie or a criminal, just the world's biggest asshole. Still, in turn, my mom cared for Jack. In turn, Jack cared for me. When a girl pushed me down on the playground, he followed her after school, shoved her against the wall, and said that if she ever touched his little sister again, he'd break her arm. He walked between me and the homeless folks we passed on the street. When they hassled us, he covered my ears and cussed them out. He always shared his candy, panicked if I ate it too quickly, watched me chew as if he were afraid I might choke. He stole pretty things for me, origami paper, hot pink erasers, stickers. My mother ignored the ways Jack grew stranger and darker. As a teenager, he came home with a lip pierced in at the school bathroom with a safety pin, and tiny, squiggly shapes pricked into his skin by a friend's shaky hand using a sewing needle dipped in pen ink. But that was the Bush era, a time for Bay Area teens to go to punk shows and rage against the man. Besides, I may have called Jack my brother, but my mom never called him her son. Her responsibility to him, as she saw it, was to make sure he survived to adulthood, no more and no less. I hadn't heard anything from Jack for more than a decade when I got a call from my mom in March. Jack had gotten in touch to tell her he was back in Berkeley. He gave her a phone number, which she read to me. I have nothing to say to him, I snapped, but I still remembered the number long after I hung up. Memory works in funny ways. When the acceptance letter came for journalism school, I said yes, even though I'd never wanted to move back to Berkeley and even though it felt too much like following in my mother's footsteps. This was different. It was grad school. Patrick Bloom was an instructor there, and I had applied before I knew Jack was back. I hadn't made my decision for him, but I had called him the first week of classes. Jack, I said after he picked up. When the line went dead, I was certain that it was him. I've been texting him since, but I haven't heard a thing. I roll over to face the ceiling. I angle my phone toward my face and it lights up. Spots flood my vision. No wonder I can't sleep when this shit is so bright. The house I'm watching is cool. You should swing by, I type. And then I add the address. Not that he'd ever come. Not that I'm certain I'd want him to, anyway. I leave my iPhone face up, but it does not illuminate with the message that night. I don't fall asleep until sunrise. I wake in the afternoon. In the master bath, I examine the deodorant, crusted stains wringing the pits of my shirt. I peel it off, put it in a pile for the laundry. After my shower, I can't find the bath towels, so I wipe Patrick Bloom's skinny hand towel and tiny square of a face towel all over my body. I feel like a cat rubbing itself on things to leave its mark. I bring my laptop to the patio. I'm supposed to take notes on an episode of a podcast for my radio class. My whole body hurts from the lack of sleep, and though the podcast is supposed to be some great feat of audio editing, it can't hold my attention. My head keeps drooping. When my laptop dies, I realize I forgot to bring a charger. Of course. Biking all the way home for a stupid charger sounds awful. I could go upstairs to Patrick Bloom's study. He might have a charger there, but I already bled all over his cutting board. I don't need to make things worse by breaking into his study. I'd inevitably fuck something up, accidentally set off an alarm, or knock over some priceless heirloom. I don't know what kind of delicate, precious things someone like Patrick Bloom would have in there. Forget the computer. I'm only here for two more days. I'll consider it a digital detox. I want to be having more fun in Patrick Bloom's home than I am. I get the joint I brought and take it outside to smoke on the deck. I hope his neighbors don't complain about the smell. No one cares about pot in Berkeley, but I don't know if the rules are different in the hills. These are the hippies who sold out, not the hippies who became crackheads and now line the streets just a few miles away. I take a long rip. I was 13 when I first smoked. We lived in a two-story apartment by then. 
two-bedroom apartment by then. My mother and I still shared a room, which we split down the middle with a folding wooden divider. Jack had his own room barely bigger than a closet. It was so small that when he and I sat on the carpet beside his bed, leaning against the comforter that smelled like Old Spice and boy body, the toes of my checkered vans touched the door. I want you to smoke with me, he said. I snorted like it was a joke, but he looked me square in the eyes. I don't want you doing it for the first time with some randos. I watched how the light flickered off his face as he took the first hit. I tried to mask, match his stoicism, the length of his inhale, the way his finger flickered over the carb. My throat screamed, but I didn't dare cough. When the bowl was cashed, Jack put a mixed CD in his discman and leaned close to share his headphones. His bloodshot eyes half closed. He tongued his lip piercing, wheeling that little metal hoop around and around. I wanted to be closer to him. I wanted, I thought, with a flash that scared me, to lick the curve of skin just above the chain he wore around his neck. A song came on, and Jack pulled the jewel case from under his bed. The track names were written, handwritten in Sharpie. The one we were listening to was called Sister Jack. It's you, he said with a stoner's laugh. He patted my knee and the inside of my leg went electric. I gripped the banister of Patrick Bloom's patio until the worn wood starts to splinter. I blow a cloud of smoke and imagine it conjuring Jack. Why do I still think of him as part of my life? <laughs>